Good afternoon and welcome to RUSI members to this event on the core level of command. We referenced the Bosnia campaign of 25 years ago in the title because it was an inflection point for the post-Cold War era and signposted important changes. For the headquarters of the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, ARC, it also signalled a distinct shift in how they worked. That organisation, a headquarters based in the UK, commanded and staffed by majority British staff, but answering to NATO and not the UK government, has continued to change. ARC is one of, I think, nine uh, structures, uh, similar structures in European NATO today, one of several in the US. Before introducing our speakers today, I just wanted to refresh your memories as to what the core level of command was designed to do. In many ways, the core has been the highest level of tactical command in the land domain, as opposed to at the operational or strategic level of war. As envisaged in intercontinental war fighting, the core was one of the largest army groupings made up of two or sometimes three divisions under an army group with between 20 and 50,000 people under it, spread across armor, infantry, and supporting arms, the Cold War saw the core level become the allied structure of choice for organizing national contributions to deterrence operations. After 1945, the mainstay of the UK contribution to the standoff of the Warsaw Pact militaries was one British Corps, also known as One Corps UK, a title with a history stretching back to the Battle of Waterloo. After the Cold War, First British Corps became HQ Arc, and the core level became the largest standing tactical headquarters associated with land operations. In theory, above it would stand an operational level headquarters whose job was to apportion forces between competing theatres of war. Today, that has changed a little, and the operating environment has much to do with it. During the Cold War, forces were starting from a fixed position and waiting for an enemy on a much studied battleground. After the wall came down, the Corps would understand the need to shift in their way of fighting, something that required a metamorphosis for them uh, to make them fit for task in Bosnia. There they arrived after the UN peacekeeping mission, including the period of the massacre in Srebrenica, to enforce the Dayton Peace Accords. A peace enforcement, perhaps peace building mission that was not familiar to NATO. In fact, this was NATO's first out of area mission. Since then, HQ Arc has been deployed to Bosnia in 1999, to Afghanistan in 2006, and again in 2009, each mission being markedly different to its predecessor. Given that requirement to constantly adapt and the anniversary of I-4 in Bosnia, we're privileged to have two speakers with us today to compare and contrast the arc and its journey and to perhaps help us understand some of the continuities as well as the divergences. First to speak will be Field Marshal Mike Walker, Baron Walker of Aldringham. Commissioned in 1966 in the Royal Anglian Regiment, his early career saw him with NATO in Germany and on national deployments in Northern Ireland, where he was mentioned in dispatches, and Gibraltar. Despite never holding the rank of Colonel, Mike commanded 10th Armoured Brigade in Germany before, uh, before becoming uh, the one British Corps Chief of Staff. Thereafter, he moved into high gear, commanding the ARC on its deployment to I-4 as Sink Land, Commander-in-Chief Land Forces in the UK, uh, Chief of the General Staff and subsequently Chief of the Defence Staff until he retired from the military in 2006. His experience of the core level of command spans great power competition, as well as that huge adaptation and shift to out-of-area peace enforcement operations. It's a significant period and diverse operating environments. Next to speak will be the commander, the current commander of HQ Arc, Lieutenant General Sir Ed Smythe Osborne, who was commissioned in the lifeguards uh, in October 1983. Ed served in a variety of appointments, ranging from troop commander to commanding officer, and again, geographically dispersed between the UK, Europe, Central America, the Balkans, Middle East and Asia. As one would expect, as well as uh, his time on the front line, he did his time in staff appointments as Chief of Staff in 42 Northwest Brigade in Battis in Canada, as MA to Sink Land at HQ ISAF, and before his current appointment, he was Deputy Commander of the NATO Rapid Deployable Corps in Italy. 
In command, he's led the Intelligence, Surveillance and Reconnaissance Task Force in Kosovo, the Household Cavalry in Great Britain and Afghanistan, 38 Irish Brigade in Ulster, London District and the Household Division. Now listen, the structure of the events as follows. Field Marshal Walker, then General Ed, each speaking for around eight to ten minutes and after that we'll have a conversation between them about the arc and how and why it's evolved. In the remaining time I'll open the floor, uh, the floor to questions and pose the best of yours to the two seniors. Please use the question and answer section on the bottom of your screen, uh, Zoom screen at the bottom in the panel at the bottom. I will pick the best off there and we'll go from there. All of this session is on the record but listen, we do have a hard stop time at 1500. I know that we could probably go on for days, but we need to call it uh, at some point. So on that basis, let's start this. Field Marshal, over to you. Peter, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. In 1989, the old first British Corps, along with everybody else in the intelligence communities, had absolutely no idea that the Berlin Wall was going to fall. And although commanders tactical picnics on the edge of the Bockenham Bowl in North Rhine-Westphalia, at which they described how they were better able to defeat part of the Third Shock Army than their predecessors kept people happy, many were not convinced. But for some 40 years, we saw the main nations within NATO, a multinational deployment of their corps across the so-called Central Front. Many had doubts whether this plan would work if hostilities broke out, but it never had to be tested and arguably, of course, the plan itself was enough. Because the collapse of communism took us all by surprise, no planning had been done within the Corps for such an event. Our CNC of the day was very keen to keep our forces involved in operations at the core level, as Peter has described. And when the notion of a rapid reaction forces was put forward, he was quick to offer the old first British Corps as the base and basis for its development. So in 1992, the ARC was born. Its mission was to redeploy and reinforce within Allied Command Europe and to conduct Petersburg missions out of NATO, which were military tasks of a humanitarian, disarming and peacekeeping and peacemaking nature that the Western European Union would be empowered to undertake. My predecessor, General Jeremy McKenzie, set the ARC up. And by the time I arrived in late 94, we had some 16 nations involved on the staff. A trip to Bosnia was on the cards as NATO's first out of area operation, as Peter has said. But although nations had committed forces to the possibility and we trained for the prospect, it was very much an on off situation. However, before we could take over from the UN, the Dayton Peace Agreement had to be signed. And it subsequently it was done in Paris in December 95. This was an agreement signed by the political leaders of Bosnia and Herzegovina on behalf of their people. It was therefore their agreement, not the West's, not NATO's, and this was a very important distinction. It was in effect the internal strategic consent needed to ensure at least some chance of NATO success. And this was far more important than the external consent achieved in most of the rest of the world. And so it was that we launched ourselves into a country in which the result of 42 months of civil war was that it was littered with mines and the wholesale and vindictive destruction of almost everything. There was no economy to speak of, no industry, no commerce, no bridges, no electricity, no water supplies, no telephones, no buses, no schools, no universities, no hospitals, and no law, law and order to name but a few. In short, no infrastructure whatsoever. Fear and hatred were everywhere, and the only things which had any semblance of organization and effectiveness were the factional armies. If there was ever an object lesson in why civil war should be avoided, Bosnia at the end of 95 provided it. We recognized that our actions and dealings would have, with the, we would have with the factions would aim to achieve consent and be conducted transparently and with even handedness. It was also made very clear that we would brook no nonsense and there would from the outset be a willingness by NATO sea, air and land forces to compel compliance by force where necessary. 
Indeed, these NATO forces from some 32 nations were going to be configured, equipped and competent to employ the full range of weapon systems to conduct war fighting and that and would thus outmatch any challenge from any, anybody which they would respond to with decisive military action. But in the event, these were not the weapons that we were to use with our force of some 55,000 on the ground. From a core point of view, it was very clear at the outset that the key to our success or failure was the ability to get such a disparate force acting with coherence, operating to one intent, maintaining the initiative and being seen by all to be implementing the military aspects of the agreement with even handedness, with capability and with determination. With orders and intentions having to be transmitted in English from a British Corps commander through an American division to a Swedish brigade, to a Polish battalion, and thence to a Latvian platoon. This was not going to be simple stuff. Moreover, it was the area in which any of the factions could make mischief and exploit for their own ends, as each of them tried as often as they could. There had been a key phrase that was inserted into the Dayton Agreement document, which was what became known as the Silver Bullet Clause. At the end of many of the provisions in the military annex, words similar to, or any other requirement that the NATO commander may stipulate, were added. This produced unparalleled power to the military elbow, even greater than was in first envisaged, because it not only allowed us to be wholly but responsibly dictatorial in our demands upon the faction's military forces, but as it became clear that the other 11 annexes covering political, economic, humanitarian, law and order and the like, gave those responsible for implementation no empowerment of a similar nature, we were able to use our military clout, either in direct support of, or as the bulwark behind any measure requiring compliance from the entities. In the absence of any direct attack by any of the factions against NATO forces, our focus became their perceptions, that nothing should cause each entity in its own perception to believe that what had been promised at Dayton was not being delivered for them in the way that they interpreted it. There was no doctrine for this kind of military operation, and we were pushing the frontiers of experience and activity. Our weapons became our joint military commissions at which orders were given to the factions, our faction liaison teams, our psychological operations, not mind bending, but mind informing so that the truth could be told. Our radio and TV broadcast stations, our real and technological eyes and ears. These were the methods by which we conducted the close, deep and rare battles so important in other arenas of war. My commanders were having to achieve more through the words that they spoke than through the real combat power at their disposal. It has brought a whole new dimension to the term operations other than war. Peter, I think I've talked enough now and I'll hand over to Ed. Uh, Phil Marshall, that was really a, a most eloquent, concise and, and pithy intervention. You paint a fantastic canvas about the shifting between, you know, what was the, the, the Cold War, the, the, the front line, that we knew it against the USSR and, and a very different change. And we'll get into some of that shortly, but let me just hand over to Ed, who I think equally had, you know, significant changes to come over with the ARC. So um, General, over to you. Peter, very, very good afternoon uh, from the ARC down at Innsworth. Um, I, I guess it may surprise some of your listeners to learn just how multinational the ARC is today. And furthermore, the extent to which multinationalism has played a significant role in the deep history uh, of the British core. And I'll take a few minutes now, if I may, following the field marshal, to set out how we are configured today, what our task and purpose is, um, and for my money, some of the factors that have driven this evolution. Firstly, a, a brief nod to history. Um, the headquarters is, is 28 years old in its current form this year. Uh, and as you heard, it, it stood up uh, as a rapid reaction corps on the 1st of October 1992 at Bielefeld in Germany. And until 2010, it made its home in Rheindalen 
before moving to our current station here at Imjin Barracks, Gloucester, a decade or so ago. Now, the, the permanent headquarters uh, at Imjin contains staff, officers and non-commissioned officers from 21 participating nations today. Uh, and we are in that respect, uh, the most diverse uh, of NATO's core headquarters. Uh, and you're right that there are, there are nine, but actually uh, one standing up uh, as I speak in Romania uh, makes 10. So we are formally uh, really now one of 10 uh, in Europe and Turkey. Uh, my deputy is an Italian two-star, uh, and indeed there is a, uh, a symmetrical series of appointments there, and as you alluded to earlier, my previous appointment uh, was as deputy commander of our Italian counterpart corps. And of interest, I have uh, three one-star branch chiefs for operations plans and support from France, the United States and Spain, respectively. Uh, so that multinationalism um, is as deep uh, as it is broad. Now, some um, may draw the conclusion that the disposition of the Ark and its transition over two centuries from First Corps to 1BR Corps, and then eventually into the Rapid Reaction Corps, which it is today, uh, is a case of making a multinational virtue out of a necessity, uh, i.e. Uh, this is in some way uh, uh, an answer uh, to reduction in mass. However, if you look closely, the history of this corps and its lineage has a very rich lifeblood of multinational command. Um, if you go back 200 years, one third of Wellington's forces at Waterloo were British, uh, only a third. And of course, during the Second World War, First Corps had under its command British, American and Canadian divisions. Affiliations, uh, which I think is interesting, we, we hold to this day. Uh, so to some extent, I, I've, I'm reminded of Mark Twain's sort of famous and oft repeated phrase that whilst history might not repeat itself, uh, it sure as hell rhymes. Now, three weeks ago, uh, we received a guidon uh, from NATO Land Command based down in Izmir as a symbol of the role that we assumed uh, actually on the 1st of January this year, uh, but with, for which we were formally uh, evaluated under the Combat Readiness Evaluation System, the Craval system, uh, last month on our exercise loyal leader. Uh, and that really marks the formal stand-up of NATO's first warfighting core headquarters since the end of the Cold War. Um, more broadly, and, and I alluded to our past affiliations with divisions, um, we have close training and exercise relationships uh, with formations from Germany, Poland, Italy, Denmark, the United States and Canada, to which I've already referred, the Czech Republic uh, and Portugal, uh, the last two being brigade-sized formations. Clearly, building and maintaining interoperability across multiple nations, as well as developing those all-important human relations that underpin moral cohesion, is a significant endeavour for the core. Uh, and I sense uh, some similarity for what the Field Marshal referred to in years gone by. But um, for me today, it, it, it comes with a commensurate opportunity for diversity of thought, for capability enhancements, um, and crucially in some areas, vital national insight. Now, as the, the Warfighting Corps headquarters, uh, we sit at readiness for operations on behalf of NATO. And our planning assumption in this role is that we would most likely operate as a second echelon or a reserve force across SACA's area of operations, not least by virtue of our physical and geographical location. And this underscores the necessity for the headquarters to be an agile organization, adept at operating in a range of climatic, 
and cultural environments uh, and ready, trained and able to operate with a range of allies and partners, most often drawing from those divisions and brigades to which I have already referred. And perhaps the best way I can describe the evolution of the core is through a triangulation or synthesis of three factors, contemporary operational demand, technological change, and doing the basics well. The fact that we are the first NATO warfighting corps since the Cold War is an implicit marker, I think, of the doctrinal preeminence that has resided with stabilization and counterinsurgency since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the aftermath of 9-11. ARC, along with our sibling NATO Corps headquarters, has pegged its evolution against the drivers of operational demand. Uh, and indeed, as you heard, uh, there is a rich history of operational deployments uh, that has taken place over the last 25 years. However, the re-emergence of great power competition, um, perhaps this time without the rules, particularly after the annexation of Crimea in 2014, has brought about a fresh emphasis and renewed focus on the complexities of warfighting, not, not only as an instrument of response, but also as a coercive lever of deterrence. And adapting to this contemporary demand requires an interface with the exponential technological change of the first of the 21st century, replete as it is with both opportunity and threat, given the proliferation of data and its ability either to inform or to overwhelm. Now, when it comes to technology, we have focused our efforts most recently on the advent of multi-domain or all-domain warfare. The lexicon varies, uh, but the intent endures. And with our ability to synchronize a range of multi-domain effects, sea, land, air, cyber, and space, at a tempo required for contemporary conflict. Uh, and this is really what we were trying to get after for, to my knowledge, the first time in a land core headquarters uh, on our recent exercise uh, last month. Our focus next year, post Craval, will be very much on experimentation and modernization in line with the NATO warfighting capstone concept uh, that work produced by Allied Command Transformation in Norfolk, Virginia, which tries to identify where we need to be in 10 to 20 years time. And underpinning all that, uh, we will have that multi-domain operational output uh, as our keystone. But in, in conclusion, as we pursue the modernization agenda, um, we should be mindful of a fact that I think unifies the arc of today uh, with that commanded by Field Marshal Walker. Uh, and that is doing the basics well. I would not underestimate the complexity of warfighting, nor the fact that this is our core role, which it most certainly is. We need to master the basics of this and sustain them at readiness through routine training which for the community of cause in Europe to which I belong is in essence the lifeblood of what we do short of deploying on operations. We need to master this through persistent revision and ingraining of our standard operating procedures and getting to the start line or the line of departure as a warfighting corps at readiness last month was a significant undertaking, but it is remarkable how quickly the institutional memory of an organization can change with the turnover of personnel. Hence the value of stopping every once in a while to participate in events such as this, given the learning that comes both from reflection and from the experiences of those who have faced similar challenges in different times. Uh, Peter, that completes my opening remarks from Innsbruck. 
Uh, General Rad, thank you very much indeed. And, and I'm I'm struck there from listening to you know both of you that that whilst in my opening statement I said you know the, the core is the highest level of tactical land formation, actually you were both straying well beyond that into into the operational domain. Whether it was the requirements in uh, in Bosnia to do you know outreach to run TV stations and uh, and radio to engage in uh, you know peace building with leaders of multiple tribes, the international nature of command that you know General Ed talked about the the integration with you know air land sea and cyber push the core more towards what we'd understand today as a sort of operational level as as crossing domains rather than being essentially land i, I wonder if if you feel you know field marshal first do, do you think that the core you know by saying it's the tactical level is that true anymore i mean it feels to me more as if it's operating in a in a more joint integrated operational level of command than previously we expected, certainly uh, during the Cold War? Well, I certainly think it was the case uh, in the early days when we went into Bosnia. There was nothing there, absolutely nothing. There was no uh, head, as headquarters above us sitting that was able to do anything more than we could do. So we had to set up our own radio stations. We had to start doing things that were very much at the higher level. We were not doing manoeuvre warfare. We were not telling um, the division to take some hill somewhere. We were doing this extraordinary uh, uh, exercise with uh, something that none of us had ever come across. So I don't think we worried too much about what level we were operating. We were all rushing around as fast as we could, trying to get the best solution to problems as they cropped up. And many of them, to be fair, we hadn't seen before we went there, whatever the training we'd done, there was a notion that uh, this was going to be easy and that uh, if they didn't behave, we would bring down artillery fire or bomb them. Uh, but of course, that wasn't going to be a very satisfactory way of doing business. So yes, we, we found ourselves going up into uh, the higher echelons. And indeed, uh, if you think about it, of course, the Dayton Agreement itself was a very strategic plan. And it feels like there was a sort of degree of, of compression there. I mean, I, I remember reading uh, Walter Bedell Smith's biography, uh, Beetle, where he, he was the chief of staff to Eisenhower during the Italian campaign, of course, uh, and then followed him through Normandy for, for the rest of the war. But, you know, and, and he was suddenly found himself at that level taking on responsibility for, you know, uh, after after the fighting had finished, for policing, for schooling, for welfare, for hospitals, for education, you know, all these things fell back to him because there was nothing else. It, it feels like the core is almost one of those, sort of, you know, your experiences both seem to see that this is what's being foisted onto you because there really isn't much above you at this level. Ed, do you think that represents where you are today? I mean, you know, how much above you do, do you expect the support or, or really are the supporting arms, all those activities that previously we expected to be held at sort of field army and, and group level, how much of those do you feel now sit within the cause level to, to arcs responsibility? Sure. Well, I think, um, first of all, there's no doubt that um, uh, much of what we do uh, at our level, and, and many have commented at much lower levels, can have strategic consequences. And it's also true to say that over the last, certainly over the last decade, we have had different roles uh, which have involved by their very nature greater responsibility certainly in the operational domain uh, the joint headquarter role the land component role for example um, i'm of course interested given the the nature of this discussion uh, that it was of course uh, in the bosnian era uh, that we had for the first time direct communications from downing street to garajda um, and I think it is true to say that there has been significant strategic compression uh, over the last sort of 25 years. But I would, I would argue that for me today, um, the levels of warfare remain unchanged uh, and the tactical and geographical framework to which we operate remains a, an incredibly useful method uh, of delineating both function uh, and responsibility. And, and I see ourselves today sitting fair and square on the tactical and operational boundary. 
Um, the bit that's really changing uh, has been the evolution of the, the domains through a period of joint warfare in, into the multi-domain piece to which I referred earlier. And our ability to prosecute operations um, for me is measured by the criteria of tempo of decision-making. Um, and as an adjunct to that, I, I think increasingly, and it has relevance to your question, I think the detail and the knowledge that is required of a core headquarters today um, it, it is very significant indeed in terms of tactical knowledge, skills and experience. I, indeed, if you don't have that level of detail, it, it, it is impossible to do your job effectively uh, and well. And of course, I sit in NATO um, in an environment where I have uh, what is currently called a multi-core land, component, land uh, command component above me, an army headquarters in days of old. Um, and I, I train to that, and that is currently headquarters land command uh, in, in Izmir, Turkey. Uh, and they work up to the joint force command uh, in either most likely Brunson uh, or in Naples, um, Joint Force Command Norfolk having slightly different responsibilities. So um, my simple answer to your question is, is I think the levels of warfare endure. Um, I find myself in the current role in sitting absolutely, albeit at the higher tactical end of that part, but probably more likely at the interface of the two, tactical uh, and operational. I think the change is in, is in the domains and in, an increasing focus on tempo, which has always been with us, uh, but, but our ability to execute the kill chain is, is ever sharper given the passage of technology and information. And I do sit in a structure that provides that top cover, if you will, that allows me to get on with the business of war fighting in the tactical domain in the manner in which I hope I have described. Thanks, I'm, I'm struck by this conversation in, in the adaptability that the core level, whether it's, you know, First British Corps, One Corps UK, HQR, you know, it has been phenomenally adaptable in shifting across the, the changing character of conflict. And, and as you say, you know, it feels like it's it's ready to adapt and change again. The, the question, I guess, is, is does that come down to manpower and, and the core level has a fairly significant you know standing manpower bill that sits with it or, or is it about you know the flexibility of the commander and his top level staff that are with it the sort of mental agility that they possess uh, Phil Marshall you know what was the size of the headquarters and if you cast your mind back you know when it was in Germany and, and how much did you need to shift and change and build that as you went to Bosnia? Well, we had, uh, I, I mean, uh, I don't know if it's still much the same, but there was a sort of support battalion largely provided by the Brits who provided most of the day-to-day -day administrative necessities for the headquarters. And I suppose we must, I can't, you know, I cannot remember the numbers exactly, but we had, we had a pretty um, well-manned set of branches in the headquarters from all the various nations. And uh, what we did find was that on arrival in Bosnia, folk who had not experienced operations, in a number of cases had to be sent back because they couldn't handle the issue psychologically. And that included all nations, even some of our own. Uh, so we had to, as we were preparing to really take on the first 45 days of the Dayton Agreements requirements, which were the rather important one, and bear in mind, what we had done was quite a lot of the troops were already there, and all they did was take off their UN berries and put on their national berries. So we hadn't managed to see, for example, the French division, which did a fantastic job in Sarajevo, but we hadn't managed to do any training with them. So there was a lot of work that needed to be done, and we had to, a lot of what we achieved was done by people with the best intentions and the best training trying to work out how we could best get around these particular problems on the day. Not having 
been able to exercise for them in so many different ways. We had actually had to have people who could think uh, uh, laterally and could come up with solutions that we could employ uh, as we went through the first 45 days. And of course, the more we settled in, trying to trying to set up a headquarters in a broken building without electricity, et cetera, et cetera, the more we settled in, the better we got at it. And we made mistakes, but in the end, uh, we did prevail and it produced a solution to quite a lot of the problems. And they were multinational solutions. We had some brilliant people from all sorts of nations who came up with very bright ideas, but it wasn't in any doctrinal book and it wasn't written down as part of the plan in ab initio. And Ed, what about you? I mean, do, what size is the ark now, permanent? Uh, just, uh, just over 400, 440 or thereabouts, uh, peace establishment. And, and what's the wartime makeup? I mean, do you double in size more? Um, well, uh, good question. We, we, uh, we add about 250 to 300. Um, I'm being cautious over the numbers because one of the things that we are looking at is driving down uh, both the overall numbers uh, that we deploy and put in harm's way, the signature that any, any large number of people uh, bring with them. Um, and separately, the issues associated with going from a peace establishment to a crisis establishment and bringing on augmentees at, at taut readiness, uh, which involves a degree of preparation uh, and preparatory training, unless they have been with you before. So in other words, it, it, it is a, um, you know, it's a factor one has to uh, bring in to, to readiness. You, you would, of course, always be better with a tighter group uh, that could deploy as they were, but that's not an establishment we can sustain or hold normally uh, during peacetime. So there is a balance there. Uh, but that puts a, you know, there's a lot of stress then on on the, you know, on the core peacetime establishment, right? I mean, you know, they're they're trying to nail the jobs of everyone else and make sure that those positions are are ticking over, so that you know when the balloon goes up and and you're called forward, that actually there's something they're already running. But it also must include looking into those new areas, those new skills. I mean, you talked about technology pulling in, you know, cyber liaison officers who know what they're talking about and pulling them out from an organisation that when the balloon goes up is going to be called on elsewhere as well. There's got to be some, you know, significant tension there, right? Um, well, th 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 there, are, there are a couple of things. Um, I think ever since sort of Field Marshal Slim's time, uh, headquarters have uh, had the appetite to grow and, and periodically um, commanders and particularly chiefs of staff uh, have had to curtail that. Uh, and uh, I think there is a, an old but truthful adage that, that the larger you get, the more difficult it is to make uh, high tempo decisions unless your processes are extraordinarily refined uh, and your basing uh, is secure in a way which for us often is not the case. Um, secondly, we do, we do benefit markedly uh, from individuals um, particularly in the reserve, who wish to repeat coming back to the ARC uh, for a series of exercises. So there, there is a modicum of experience out there. Um, thirdly, um, more broadly, in, in the NATO environment, um, we do work to a reasonably common set of procedures. So where those come in from afar to support us, uh, they often already have uh, a, a close understanding of how we work. So, so for example, um, we had to generate uh, both cyber and space expertise from our recent exercise. Uh, the cyber expertise uh, we actually developed nationally, um, but in the space domain, we, we got very significant support both from United States Army Europe uh, and from Headquarters Land Command, uh, both organizations which have space capability in their peacetime establishment. So three kind of three answers to your, your question. Okay. Thanks. Can I Go add ahead. something to that? Um, yeah, uh, we, weren't as, we weren't as technologically as advanced as Ed with his, and his team are today in, in uh, 1995. But he's absolutely right about the reserves. Uh, when we got there, we found that the Dayton Accord had required us to write instructions for the military as to what they were allowed to do and what they weren't allowed to do on, on top to give detailed instructions. 
fortunately for us, we had a reserve colonel who was a judge. He played an absolute blinder and he wrote almost single-handedly all these instructions, which kept us going for the complete year and continued when uh, S4 took over after us. So it shows that actually the reserves do play a huge role. And, and by chance, we happen to have a solution to a problem that would have been a real problem if we hadn't had the solution. And, and size of staff also gives you, you know, flexibility and adaptability and just a mass to come at the myriad of problems. I, I imagine, Mike, that, you know, when you moved from, you know, Germany and did those preparations to go into Bosnia, that actually there were just so many problems that at least you had people to throw at them, right, rather than having to sort of scrape around and, get, and you know, and, and do half-hearted solutions or just delay uh, things. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, we had we had trained, we had deployed as a tactical organisation under AFSouth. We used to go down to AFSouth for regular command training sessions. But of course, nobody knew what the outcome was going to be. So we were training for something that we weren't quite sure what was the right thing. And so quite a lot of what we did was training on the job once we got there. And, and it feels like the, the international component, I mean, you... you you know, you, you push that quite heavily and it feels now from listening from both you and, and Mike's discussion that actually that international experience is exceptionally useful, you know, not just for sort of geographic experience, but in terms of the breadth of experience that it, that it brings to the headquarters, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, 21 nations, as, I, as I've described, um, I, I use uh, the field marshal's um, uh, phrase, actually, the diversity of thought. Uh, that that congregation brings is quite remarkable individually. So you get um, specialisations and knowledge um, throughout Europe and, and, and Turkey, which if we were a purely national core headquarters, we might not have access to. So that, that is remarkable in itself. And then secondly, um, we work very closely with our, with our sibling cores. Um, and the same is, is true. I mean, if you go to the regional cause uh, in Szczecin, in, in northern Poland, or, or down into Bucharest, shortly to be Sibiu in Romania, um, they provide a knowledge of the environment that we just do not have here in the United Kingdom. Um, secondly, we, we have a very close affiliation and have since our initiation uh, with Italy. Um, and by dint of our geographical locations, uh, both headquarters and countries, we, we have knowledge and expertise and insight into different areas, both of which at different times NATO is requiring of us to cover off. And the sharing of that information um, is hugely powerful. So uh, really using uh, that multinationality in a headquarters uh, as both uh, an opportunity and as a, a well of information um, it is, I think, hugely useful. And I think also, if I may say, the different characteristics that individual nationalities bring to bear, um, you know, this really is uh, building on strength through diversity uh, and something that as an organisation, we benefit from internally. We learn a lot more about our partners and allies by virtue of their presence here. And when we have the privilege to command subordinate formations generated from their countries, we have a national locus already sitting here within the headquarters to ease that transition uh, and the subsequent working arrangements. So I, I, I've got lots of questions. I'm going to have to curtail my own part in this because there are so many people asking some brilliant questions out there and I want, I want to oppose them. I want to start with one from Sir David Oman, which, um, we, I mean, he says, you know, excellent to hear the modernisation ambitions. He'd like to know, and I think this is a really interesting one, intelligence support in terms of the evolution for ARC since its first deployment to Bosnia. I mean, I imagine, Mike, that, you know, if you think back to your time as chief of staff in one call, you know, the intelligence that you get in was a fairly tried and tested route. You had your INW, you had your tripwires, you know, there were actions with it and, and, that, and that moved on. 
Bosnia must have represented something very different in terms of in terms of uh, intelligence collection, analysis, and sharing as well. And I presume, Ed, that that has changed today as well. I mean, is there less focus on human, more on common? I mean, is it Elin? Where, what does modern intelligence support the core level? What does that look and feel like um, since, uh, since Bosnia? Mike, can I start with you? Yes, um, I, I can't answer the latter part of your question, mm. but certainly from the, uh, the question of uh, intelligence collection before we went to Bosnia, of course, we had the UN to start with, who were there. We had a British commander and there were people in there. So we were able to get their intelligence take on various uh, aspects of what, what the situation was. And it was, it was pretty raw stuff. We also had the intelligence capability of Allied forces Southern Europe, who uh, had been overseeing what was going on there. And remember that the NATO air forces had been used by the UN to do some bombing there, so they had some intelligence. But the truth of the matter was that we didn't have a very clear intelligence picture. We knew we weren't going to have, have one. We tried to put together as much of the intelligence that we could. We've set up uh, uh, electronic uh, devices and so on once we got there, but most of the intelligence was human uh, that we gathered, uh, and what we had managed to gather from the other agencies there, the UN agencies I'm talking about, uh, before we went, plus what AFSouth had. So we were pretty thin on the ground as far as intelligence went when we arrived. Ed, what about today? What does it feel like? Um, it, it's very rich. Uh, it's very rich indeed. Um, the... the, the um, our ability certainly to deal with refined intelligence throughout the, the domains to which, or the areas to which you refer, whether it's humint, imint, sigint, akint, massint, um, they absolutely endure. Um, secondly, I, I would observe that the density of battlefield sensors has increased exponentially. Um, and with that, put simply, um, if we have the right sensors it becomes more difficult for an enemy to hide. Uh, and of course, there are, there are two sides to that coin. So um, it, it's fundamental and critical to, to what we do. Uh, it, it's developed hugely uh, over the intervening years, I think, to my knowledge and in my experience. Um, sharing you know, continues to have to be handled appropriately. Uh, given the nature of uh, how we process, uh, refine and use intelligence. Um, but uh, without it, uh, we would be blind. Uh, and I think I can, I can only say that um, the principles endure, uh, the availability, uh, if we target it correctly, has increased. Um, and actually the challenge um, is not to be overwhelmed by it, but to be enabled by it. And it speaks to a slightly different issue, um, which, which is delegation and potentially automation of authorities. But if I was to speak first and only now to delegation, it, it, it's how rather than keep everything in the center, or in my case, in the core headquarters, what we delegate out to the edge and with what authority for its use with the single-minded and underpinning criterion of how do we increase tempo without abrogating the responsibility for the use of lethal force. I'm just interested Ed, on that basis, whether you think there's a risk of becoming dependent on the intelligence and the information feeds. I mean, you, we, we see it, we go and visit quite a lot of you know, international headquarters who take a, a you know an intelligence led approach which over a period of time morphs into what they fail to recognize is an is an intelligence dependent approach they become stymied without without knowing what activity to undertake without the intelligence and do you do you worry sometimes that perhaps without the feed you would be left you know a little bit more reactive um well i think certainly um foresight enables one to be proactive I think we have got into the business of intelligence-led operations for some time now. 
uh, and that's something that has um, that has developed, I think. Uh, and in, in many cases, we, we were using it uh, in Bosnia and certainly in Kosovo in the, in the ISR task force, but it's developed in a very different way uh, for the core. I think uh, our underpinning doctrine remains that of recce uh, by stealth and recce pull. Uh, and therefore, to, um, to give a slightly um, broader answer to your question, I think if it's not being provided for you, you've got to go out and find it. Um, and I think fighting blind is the last thing you wish to do. Um, but if you have to fight for your intelligence, uh, then that's exactly what you end up doing. But it's not the doctrinal or indeed the preferred solution uh, from where I sit. And uh, I, I think that the danger is exactly what you have outlined. You then become reactive uh, and you are no longer the master of the events that you seek to drive, but you are driven by them. The next question uh, I, I almost just want to ask because it's from uh, Philip Ingram, who was Field Marshal's uh, Walker's SO3 G3 plans uh, back in the day. Um, and I, just, I almost just wanted to get that one in. But but I think his question is a good one. I mean, you know, the, the size and scale. I, so from a maritime background, we have, you know, a two star headquarters that seems to fulfill the sort of, or tries to fulfill sort of the higher tactical level functions that that's probably, I guess, equates to more of a brigade than even a division. I mean, it's very hard to make these comparisons. And, and actually when the core comes along, it's something that other parts of uh, the joint community don't really understand. One up from a sort of two-star battle staff in the maritime it is effectively, you know, the, the maritime component commander. Is the is the does the core actually have a true role as it is? I guess is 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 Philip's real question, or is it de facto an LCC for a for a predicted battle space, or even a you know a, a joint headquarters? Is it that framework that you know HQ Arc originally was for something much larger, and more capable? Uh, do you want me to take that first? Yes, please. Um, certainly, I don't think it's a joint headquarters in that sense. Um, the joint headquarters was, of course, above us, and, and I would see my air uh, and, and sea commanders every so often uh, for, for the odd discussion. Uh, but uh, but I, I certainly in the context of Bosnia, uh, we were very much a land component, the land component of the court. Uh, we spent our whole time focusing downwards, having to deal with things that were above us and might well have been the uh, responsibility of the force headquarters. But because there was nobody there to do it, we had to do it ourselves. So the majority of it was looking downwards, as you say, and <clears throat> trying to get that right. But <clears throat> we had to venture off up into these, uh, these areas above the operational level because of the rather curious nature of the operation. And of course, we had we had our doctrine written for us in a funny sort of way, because it was called the Dayton Agreement. It had been written that was what we were to implement. Uh, so that was how I would see it. Um, and I think that probably I don't know how the other services regard it, but it, it's a very different beast to one which is masterminding maneuver warfare of uh, heavy armor and all the guns and so on around the place it's very much more a sort of thoughtful headquarters running an event uh, which at that time we had not done before thank you ed um i'd say two quick things to that really i think first and foremost without being simplistic it's all about the deep um and i i, I divide the deep into geography function and time but, but we have a saying down here, which is fight the deep, synchronize the close and protect the rear. Uh, and, and I think the core headquarters earns its money uh, by the former, by fighting in the deep. Secondly, um, I, I've referred to the multi-domain fight uh, and, and the advent of both cyber and space domains. And I think in the land environment, the plugs and sockets for that are currently best at the core level. So uh, regardless of um, certainly our history of other roles dragging us up uh, and some legacy desire to remain in that space. 
I am very clear uh, that not only are we in the tactical space, but the core level has that deployable role, particularly in those two areas in the land environment where it can add value. So I, we, we're almost running out of time. I'm just going to try and group all these questions together. I mean, there's a great comment from Ian Andrews and others, which we'll copy and paste and, and, and send to both the speakers. You don't have time to read them, but I'm trying to pull together some of them. I mean, th there's a feeling uh, on the one hand that, that people are asking about, you know, the structure of the core almost for counterinsurgency and, and peacekeeping operations. So there's questions about, you know, how much international, how much diplomatic engagement, how much uh, policing, how much civilian defense, how much, you know, uh, multinational security and intelligence personnel, how much that stuff should be integrated. Uh, there's, there's, you know, questions about how does the core integrate non-kinetics as the field marshal talked about in, in his opening statement. But then, of course, there's another feeling that says, actually, that's fighting the last war. And, and does fighting the next one in terms of moving towards great power competition require us to go back in almost a circle and start trying to learn, relearn some of those lessons from, you know, first British Corps back in the day? And how easy is that to do in a sort of circular way, rather than structuring for the last fight to try and think about how we develop flexibility for the next one. I don't know, Phil Marshall, if you've got any views on that. Well, um, uh, as I say, I think, I think the lessons learned uh, uh, process, as far as I can remember, was there was never everything done for the first British Corps. Uh, things had moved on, but there wasn't a sort of a, 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 a vague mecum. There might be. I might be wrong there, but I never saw one myself. And certainly when I was chief of staff, I was not involved in drawing one up. Because of course we didn't think the old British Corps was going to suddenly go, go to the wall. Uh, but yes, I, I mean I think it's I think it's important to try and pick up the lessons learned, and and the lessons learned on Bosnia were significant. For example, we had no civil military infrastructure <clears throat> at the time; it all had to be made made on the hoof. Uh, the, the, the attempts, and even I know it's a very difficult area, and I suspect we haven't even got that right today, but dealing with all the other aspects of the uh, agreement, uh, with law, with policing, with civil affairs, with government, and all these things, there was actually no mechanism for dealing with that on arrival. One was built up slowly, eventually under the, uh, the high representative, but that took a long time. And so if there was one lesson I would say on this business about whether we are into um, traditional type of warfare or uh, peacekeeping and uh, counterinsurgency, I would say that the likelihood is that we're going to be at that end of the spectrum rather more than going in for traditional war fighting. And I mean, Ed has referred to it with all the sort of cyber stuff coming on at the moment. It's going to look a very different battlefield to the sort of battlefield that a core used to operate in during the Cold War. Thank you. Ed. Um, well, first and foremost, I think um, we are training against the right model uh, as a war fighting core to develop our procedures and our processes um, to account for whatever is thrown at us. And there used to be a simplistic saying about train hard uh, and fight easy. Um, and secondly, uh, um, I, I really, I rather take the field marshal's point, and, and when I refer to, you, you know, fighting the deep in terms of geography, function, and time, I think time is is an interesting aspect in terms of this particular question, because we tend to focus our effort on the execution phase uh, of what we used to do, and that is by itself an excellent training mechanism, but it constitutes a failure a failure of deterrence and a failure to act in the period before that. Uh, and that is something we would be wise to get after. And I think the opportunity, if we specialize and stay longer in roles, is that the training and exercise program can be broadened alongside some of the techniques to which you and others have referred to allow us to do that and by that token, to be a more effective tool of deterrence. 
uh, gentlemen, we've got to draw stumps there. I knew we'd be able to go on for longer, and and it's my fault that there are so many questions left open, and I and I haven't. Uh, had the chance to uh, ask you of them. Thank you so much for giving your time. I think the audience would agree if they were in the room, they'd be delighted with how much you've given to us. Thanks to all our members for attending today. I hope you enjoyed this session. And to those watching from across the streaming service, I'd like to remind you that RUSI is a membership organisation and members effectively fund our work, allowing us to challenge the orthodoxy of military thinking and decision making. In exchange, our members tell us that they get benefits from us, insights, understanding, perspective that would otherwise be lacking in their professional development. Whilst the UK MOD provides no core funding for RUSI research, we do work with the Royal Navy, British Army and increasingly UK Strategic Command to help them with their approaches to the challenges of today and tomorrow. Now, for around £10 a month, individual members can get these benefits and more. If you consider yourself connected to the profession of arms, you might consider becoming a member yourself or giving it as a Christmas present. You can find details at rusi.org forward slash membership. Members, of course, can join us for our session with the Secretary of State of Defence, Ben Wallace, this Friday and then next week at the RUSI CDS Christmas Lecture. Sign up online. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.